morning, everyone. How are you, po? And it's a blessing to see everyone. And uh, I haven't followed this up for a while. How's your Bible reading? We remember uh, the first Sunday of the year, the leadership asked you, encouraged you to develop this as a habit, to read the Bible. And that's why we do a devotional every week. Look at your uh, bulletins. Okay, and uh, I hope that you're doing it. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but it's, it's our prayer that really that you have to do it. Okay, amen? amen? Is that an amen? Okay, today we continue with our series entitled Keywords in the Christian Life. And as I've said, this is a study of some of the most beautiful words in the Bible. And these are of such importance that if you understand these words... You understand what the Bible teaches us. But if you don't, you have missed the whole message of the Bible itself. <coughs> Last or two Sundays ago, we studied justification. Again, that's the divine miracle whereby God declares righteous. A sinner who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is by the grace of God through faith. It is a grace of God through faith apart from human works on the basis of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then last Sunday we talked about propitiation. Remember the wrath of God. And uh, God has to be satisfied. God has to be propitiated. And when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he was the high priest and also the sacrifice that was offered up to God. And because of that, God was propitiated. God was satisfied. And today we're going to talk about reconciliation. Reconciliation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for bringing us here and uh, thank you for your protection. And we just ask, oh God, again, would you please open the eyes of our hearts that we will understand and comprehend your word. Help us, Lord. Challenge us that when we go out of this place, we will really live by your word. Empower me. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, in the Greek, there are three primary words used for reconcile or reconciliation. But the chief word that is used is katalaso, which means to change completely. So when you reconcile two people who are enemies, you are changing their complete orientation. Where once they were far apart, separated, but now because you have changed them completely, they are now friends again. All right? In the Bible, when you see the word reconcile or reconciliation, it always implies two things. First, reconciliation between people, nations, races, groups, or individuals, and God. Reconciliation always involves, first of all, the removal of that problem that causes enmity in the first place. So reconciliation is impossible without dealing with the problem that chases us apart or separates us. Reconciliation then is impossible without dealing with the problem that divides us. Number two, reconciliation always involves the restoration of a relationship, of friendship, and conciliation. Whenever you see reconciliation or reconcile in the Bible between people or between man and God, there is always the removal of the problem and restoration of friendship. Now, in order for us to understand the meaning of reconciliation between man and God, we have to go back in the beginning of time. Now, in the Garden of Eden, you see God and man were close. There was no, nothing between them. Nothing could come between them at all. They, have, they had a close, personal relationship. Now, what happened in the garden was that Adam and Eve sinned, and they chose to step away from God. <coughs> they took a step away from that close, intimate fellowship with God. And God, you see, when man turned away from God, God also turned away from man. Alright? 
God cannot have a relationship with man when there is something in between. Remember the doctrine of the wrath of God, yung galit ng Diyos? God is, that's a settled, the wrath of God is the settled hostility towards sin. Settled, okay? That means, the holiness of God cannot and will not ex coexist with sin. Of any of its variations, whatever form that sin is, God cannot. But God's wrath is not uncontrollable anger. It is not vindictive bitterness. Okay, do, do you remember there was this agency that recruited a spy? Okay, I remember this story. They recruited the spy, so they opened it up, or an agent, to replace James Bond. Kwentong uh, kutsero na naman to, ha? To replace James Bond. And uh, so they had several tests. And the final test, there were only three people in the short list. Two men and one woman. Okay, they were uh, sent to a warehouse. And they were given gun, a gun. A handgun with blank bullets. But the, the agents told them, you have to kill the person inside that warehouse. But they didn't know, these three, they didn't know that the gun had blank bullets. So the first one, man A, went inside. But in just a minute, they didn't know that the man or the person inside that warehouse that they have to kill was their spouse, okay? So after a minute, man A came out, and he was crying. He said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm sorry. Oh, so he failed the exam. So he would not be the new agent. And man B came, entered the warehouse, and after five minutes, he went out, and he was also crying. I'm sorry. I couldn't kill my wife. No, no, I couldn't do it. Then the woman came. The woman came. And after 10, 15 minutes, there was noise. Ba -boo, ba -ba -ba -boo. And when she went out, she was perspiring and said, You didn't tell me that this gun had blank bullets. And so what I did, I banged his head and I put him and everything. And that. He's, now he's dead. That is anger. No, that is not God's wrath. Okay? Nakon niya ba yon? All right. So God cannot have a relationship with man. If there is something in between, and that's sin, okay? That's God's wrath. Now, so when man turned away from God, God turned away from man. But then something else happened. Several years or thousands of years later, a baby born, a baby was born in Bethlehem. And God turned his back toward man again. And that's the situation, and that situation is also the same in our situation today. And there are lots of people who find themselves in that situation. Man or God has turned his back toward man, but man is turned away from God. And all he has to do, God has done everything to restore that relationship. And you have to believe that he sent his son to die for you. That's what he's asking for. But sadly, many, many people are still searching for another way. Or they are still taking it on their own that they can save themselves. That is the problem, brothers and sisters in Christ. God is just asking you just say, yes, I believe in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Your son, he died for me. The problem, brothers and sisters in Christ, is of course sin. That's the great divider. So Isaiah 59, 21 says, Your sin has separated you from God. And that is the way. We are all apart from Him. We are on this side and God is on the other side. And there's a ravine, there's a chasm that separates God and man. And that is sin. Now for us to understand that more, I think again, Pastor is guilty of having a long introduction. So let us go to our text. Okay, our text is one of the mountain peaks of Holy Scripture. It joins with the other mountaintop 
uh, passages like Isaiah 53, Psalm 23, Hebrews 11, uh, Philippians chapter 4, John chapter 3. And these schol the scholars are saying that these are the great passages in the word of God. And they had long brought comfort to troubled hearts. Now, I think it's fair to say that more people have gone to heaven because of this passage than any other passage in the book of Romans. And when I was doing my manus or my draft, I asked the Lord that he would help me make these profound truths to make it or to make them uh, simple enough for anyone to understand. So in our discussion today, there are again three things that I would like for us to know. First, our impossible problem. No, this is our pitiful condition apart from Christ. And Paul uses four words to describe our spiritual condition apart from Jesus Christ. And first, in verse 6a, he says, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless. The first key word is powerless. And it means utterly helpless with no means of escape or it you are unable to change your basic nature. The King James Version says, without strength. The word itself means weak. The word itself means weak, and it refers to a physical weakness of the body. Here it means, in our uh, discussion today, it means spiritual and not physical. Paul is saying that when we come to God, in, when we stand before him, we are completely powerless to change our basic nature. Now, listen to this. I'm sure you've heard this. This is statement. God helps those who help themselves. Right or wrong? hati kayo. You know, that is very wrong. It is not biblical because the Bible view is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Or if you would prepare, God helps those who are willing to admit that they cannot help themselves. And as I thought about this truth, my mind was drawn towards this hatted or hot debated issue today, the root of homosexuality. By the way, there are youth are in charge of preaching every last Sunday of the month. And we started this last March when our Deacon Darwin, he talked about priority of prayer. Okay? Then last month, Brother Joseph Mendoza talked about our finances, uh, savings, and budgeting. Tonight, we'll talk about Brother Tim Tamon, all right? We'll talk about LGBT. No, it's not what uh, Alma Moreno defines it, lesbian, gay, bakla, tomboy. No, no, no. LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. If you want to know more about homosexuality, would you please come tonight and support our youth? Okay? Now, going back to what I'm saying, the root of homosexuality, is it learned, a learned behavior? Is there some genetic predisposition? What part does family upbringing play? Is the sexual orientation fixed at the moment of birth? Can a homosexual ever change? Now, radical gay activists have uh, succeeded in co-opting mainstream media that the view, their view is that homosexual behavior is a fix, uh, uh, it, it is a fixed reality for a percentage, for a certain percentage of our population. They argue that if you cure gays and le lesbians, it's a hoax. It's a hoax because how can someone change his basic sexual behavior? They're saying, how can you cure someone whose condition he has no control over with? Now, in reply, two things must be noted without regard to the question of origins. The Bible clearly and always presents that sexual behavior is sinful. Romans chapter 1 verses 26 to 27 
settle the issue forever. That widespread homosexuality is one mark of a godless and depraved society. Now, on the question of changing the basic nature, the radical gay activists are partly right and they are partly wrong. They are right when they say that homosexual behavior or hom those who practice homosex those who practice homosexual behavior are or cannot change themselves. May I say that again? Those who practice homosexuality cannot change themselves. They are right about that. But they are wrong when they say a homosexual cannot change himself. It is virtually impossible to redirect the sexual drive of a committed homosexual apart from Christ. That's what the verse is telling us. Once sin grips you, you cannot change your basic nature. You cannot change yourself. So homosexuals need the same one that we need, the same thing that we need, a life-changing encounter, a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. Because only in Him, there is power to change the unchangeable. If you're familiar with Celebrate Recovery, you can go there and check. They have a group of homosexuals. They, they practice homosexual behavior before, but now they are being used to glorify Him, to minister to people who are also trying to get out of that problem. By the way, brothers and sisters in Christ, all efforts, all efforts to improve society based on moral reformation will ultimately fail. You can change yourself on the outside. You can learn new patterns of thinking and speaking. You can even reprogram yourself by stopping certain kinds of deeds or certain kinds of destructive behavior. But you cannot change your basic nature. You are powerless. And for that to be changed, there must be a power that will come from an outside source, not within you. So man is weak. He is powerless to change his basic nature. And second, man, sinner, is a wicked man. Christ died for the ungodly. The second key word is ungodly, which means you live your life as if God didn't exist. Precisely. Because you can change. You cannot change your basic nature. Then you live your life as if God doesn't exist. You go on your own way. You, li you, you live or invent your own morality. You live to please yourself. You do things that you think that are right in your own eyes. In short, you try to set up yourself as God. And then worship yourself. Remember, remember this, to be godless is not to wallow in sin like what the pig does when he rolls in the mud. It applies as much to a moral man as to a serial killer or a rapist. One is just as godless as the other. Why? Inside every man or even, even woman, there is a desire lurking inside us to be our own God. Man is weak. Man is wicked. And third, in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. That's the key word, sinners. It means to miss the mark. Now, it pictures us of a, an archer who takes aim and then looks straight at the bull's eye, pulls his ball string taut, and then releases the arrow, but completely misses the mark. He thought that he was uh, aiming at the right thing, but something happened. The arrow completely misses the target. And that is the picture of a sinner. You try and fail. You try and fail. You try and fail. You even do what is best, but that best isn't good enough. You even set a high standard for yourself, but it always misses the mark. That's a description of a sinner. And lastly, not only that he is weak, 
He's wicked, he's wayward, he's also warlike in verse 10. For if while we were God's enemies, that's the key word, an adversary. The Bible is telling us that before you came to know Christ, before you had a relationship with Christ, you are in the devil's camp. You are opposed to him. You are an enemy of God. Now think about it. Before you came to know Christ, you were one of God's enemies. Kaaway ng Dios. But you may say, Pastor, you know, I have always loved God. I love Him. No. Apart from Jesus Christ, you cannot truly love God. How can you say that you love the Father when you don't love the Son? How can you say that you love God when you reject His Son? No amount of sentimental sugar coating can reduce the stark truth. You were an enemy of God. I was an enemy of God before I came to know Christ. Are you with me? Brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's sum up. This is our condition. This is our pitiful condition. We are powerless. We cannot change our basic nature. And because we cannot change our basic nature, we are ungodly. We live as if God doesn't exist. And because of that, we are also a sinner. We try, we always try, but we always fail because we miss the mark. And we are an enemy of God, hostile to Him. And you know what? We have that fear to face Him. And may I say, brothers and sisters in Christ, that is the judgment of God on the entire human race. No one is, no exemption, no exception there. You, you search the four corners of the globe and you won't find any exception to the truth. Not only that we are all sinners, we are also powerless, we are also ungodly, we are also enemies of God. And may I say again that it doesn't matter if you accept this truth or not, if you believe this truth or not, you, you may even say, you know, Pastor, I'm not ungodly, I'm not an enemy of God. If I, I know lots of people who are much worse than me. They are sinners. But God's word washes away those objections. This is the truth about you when you stand before God on your own. Apart from His divine grace. You are weak. You are wicked. You are warlike. You are wayward. And that truth leaves us with no hope in ourselves. We cannot. We are utterly unable to save ourselves. Your condition, my condition, we are all powerless apart from Christ. We may therefore draw one major conclusion in all this. God's love is not dependent on anything in you because there is nothing in you that is worth loving. That is, there is nothing in us that forces God to love us. You see, sin has infected our lives that it destroyed and distract or distorted even those parts that you believe to be beautiful. Sin uglifies. Is there a term, uh, Elder? Sin uglifies everything that it touches. And therefore, how can God love us? There is sin. There is no reason for God to love us. No reason at all except this. That's who God is. He loves you. He loves me because God is love. And He can help loving us even though we were His enemies. His love is both greater than our sin and in spite of our sin. God shouldn't love us, but He does. And that's the wonder of ages, brothers and sisters in Christ, that God would love His sworn enemies. Now let us go to God's incredible solution to our impossible problem. Verses 7 to 8 reveal the unearthly nature of God's love. His solution to our problem 
is so unusual that it goes far beyond human reason. We would never think this up on our own. Only God could conceive this solution. Now in verse 7, it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. Here's a good question uh, for discussion, for you to discuss in your growth groups. How many people are you willing to die for? When the chips are down and when that moment comes and you have to make a decision, how many people are you willing to lay down your life for without reservation and without hesitation? Perhaps a few, a handful. When I look at my list, only a handful. Your parents, your spouse, your children, your mother-in-law. Mm. But that's about it. My friends, but the truth is, you'll never know until that moment comes. That's why your prayer, Lord, please don't put me in that agonizing situation. But suppose it, it's going to happen. To be honest, I'm sure you love, you, you, there are so many people that you dearly love, but you are not ready to take a bullet at, in your back for them. We have heard of stories, of courageous stories, of soldiers sacrificing their lives for their comrades. For example, a squad of soldiers was in patrol, and then a grenade was uh, lobbed in their midst, and then the master sergeant would drop on that grenade and absorb the blast, right, killing himself instantly, and then his, his uh, comrades would live, right? And there are ex examples of uh, rare uh, stories of courage. Now, again, talking about war and soldiers, have you heard of these American soldiers who captured a uh, Viet Cong and he was asked to serve them, so he cooks soup for them, he cooks rice for them, but you know, they mock him and they would nail his sleepers, and so when he's in a hurry, he would fall, they would put, uh, a bucket of cold water on the door so that when he opens it, you know, so one day, I, I don't know, perhaps that they were uh, shared with the word of God and they said, you know, we're sorry. So they were repentant. They called the Viet Cong. We are sorry. We're doing this to you. From now on, we will not mock you anymore. Really? The Viet Cong said, oh, okay, okay. From now on, no speed on musu, no speed on rice. Did you get that? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have heard of examples of rare courage and sacrifice. However, they all have the same thing. They demonstrate the human capacity to give lives for those whom they love. But at now, at least we understand why do these people sacrifice their loves for their loved ones. But God went far beyond what we could do. And that's what verse 8 is saying. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice how God, how the love of God transcended anything humanity is able to produce. That the love of God was put in display when His Son died for us when we were still sinners. You see, while we were still weak and wicked and wayward and warlike, God died for us. He didn't die for His friends. He died for His enemies. He didn't die for the people whom He loved or for, for those people who love Him. He died for those who crucified Him. Die. Christ died for sinners. Just imagine again that illustration of soldiers on patrol. Perhaps we are on patrol and then we captured an enemy and while we were interrogating him and mocking him, then a grenade, an enemy grenade was loved in the middle of us and then that enemy was the one who fell on that grenade, grenade to absorb the blast. Can you imagine dying, giving your life for your enemy? One of the hardest commandments in the New Testament is to love your enemy. How do you pray for your enemy? May you be run over by the speeding pison. May you be beaten by a rabid dog. Mm, yeah, I'm so, you know, pastor, I'm so angry at him. I want to kill him. 
But here, God showed us how He loved us while we were still sinners. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ is the final proof of God's love. Sometimes in this crazy mix of world, people would ask, where is the love of God? Where is the love of God? There's so much pain and anger and tragedy and, and heartaches and killings. Where is the love of God? Look to the cross and gaze upon the blooded form of the Son of God and you'll find the love of God. There is the love of God. There is one question. That is left. If Jesus died for us, what difference does it make? What have we gained by his bloody sacrifice? What difference does the cross make for you and for me? Now Paul answers those questions in the last three verses of our text. He does it so by reasoning from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ to our own experience. If this is true, Paul is saying, this much follows. The major point is to move from the death of the Lord Jesus Christ to the certainty, to the assurance of our salvation. And Paul sums up our infinite gain through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in three tremendous statements. First, we are justified by His blood. That's our position that we see in verse 9. We have covered this word in two messages in First Sunday and I think the third Sunday. And basically, we are declared not guilty. And the result, we are saved from the wrath of God. And the second statement is that we are reconciled by His death. That's our peace that we see in verse 10a. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. To be reconciled means that once you were uh, enemies, but now you are friends. It means that peace has broken out where once war reigned. It means that guns have been put away. The army has been sent home and finally killing has stopped. Through Jesus Christ, we were once his enemies, but now we are his friends. Through Jesus Christ, we were once aliens and strangers, but now a part of God's family. Through Jesus Christ, we were once far apart from Him, but now we have been brought to Him, to God. Through Jesus Christ, we have nothing to our credit, but now we are declared heirs with God. We are co-heirs, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And lastly, we are saved by His life. That's our preservation. How much more? Having been reconciled, we shall be saved through his life. You know this verse, it's a mystery to me for, for so many years. Because I thought that it referred, the, his life referred to his earthly life. When he was here 2,000 years ago. I, I, I didn't get the connection. And then I discovered that his life means... Not his physical life here, but his resurrection life now. <coughs> We're saved right now because Jesus is in heaven to intercede on our behalf. You get a point? When you look at this verse, try to remember Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he lives. To intercede for them. You see, we have a man in heaven called Jesus Christ. And when we sin, this man from heaven pleads by his blood for us. He intercedes for us. He speaks in our defense. Just imagine that if Jesus is there, he's alive, he is interceding for us. And because the Father is the judge, the Son, when He approaches the judge, He will always be heard. His pleas will always be heard. Now, is it important that we are saved by His life? Of course. Billy Graham once says, said, I don't preach a dying Jesus, but I preach a living Christ. And thank God it's true. Jesus is alive today. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, as long as Jesus lives, we will live with him. As long as Jesus is in heaven, we will be with him in heaven. The guarantee of our salvation, the, the assurance of our salvation is secure as long as Jesus lives. And because Jesus lives forever, we shall be saved forever. That's where we get one saved. Saved forever. Because Jesus lives forever, we shall be saved forever. Amen? amen. Parang hirap na hirap ang amen. Are you hungry na? Wala pa 12. Now, let me sum up the argument in those three concluding verses. If God has done the most, will He not do the least? If God has done the best, Will he not do the rest? If God gave his son to die for us while we were still sinners, will he not now save us to the end? If Jesus Christ died for his enemies, will he not now take his friends to heaven? If God reconciled us while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, will he not now save us now that we are his friends? The answer to all those questions is, of course, a big yes. If God has done all this, how much more will God make sure that all of his children will end up in heaven? Amen? Amen. So let us wrap up this sermon with two simple applications. First, we can have complete certainty of our salvation. Can you be certain that when you die, you're going to heaven? Is this possible or is this just wishful thinking? You see, we born-again Christians have been branded as mayabang. That whenever we're asked, are you going to heaven? Of course! We're going to heaven. But you know what? You can be positively, absolutely Without any doubt. But when you die, you'll go to heaven. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Your past has already been forgiven by his death. Your present is already secure by, through his intercession. And your future is guaranteed by his divine promise, his sacred promise. We are all assured of that fact. And lastly, we have grounds for continual rejoicing. Look at verse 11. It ends with these stirring words. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christians must have the most positive or optimistic. We are supposed to be the most positive people, the most optimistic people, the happiest people, the upbeat people. Can you look at the person beside you? <gasps> As if he has sucked three pieces of calamansi, pastor. He had drunk a bottle of dato puti. It's not, like, you, know, you know, being happy is not just a picture of our life here on earth. Do you know that? But what of our experience at the moment of death? Just imagine when you die and then when you wake up, when you open your eyes, you are at the pearly gates of heaven. You should be rejoicing and jumping. Just imagine when you wake up, there will be gnashing of teeth. There will be one. Ah. It should be different. You should be rejoicing because God intends you to walk through the pearly gates triumphant. We should be triumphant and celebrating. That's what God would like us to experience, brothers and sisters in Christ. We shall pass from this life, dapat hindi po, not with sorrowful looks or sorrowful eyes, not with downcast eyes, not with a guilty conscience, but with joy, assurance, and the full confidence that when we walk, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we pass into heaven, we will pass there with completely joyful, boasting in Jesus Christ. Right? We not only go to heaven, we will go there triumphantly. One final question. Do you have that assurance right now? Can you really say, what I've been saying before, I believe that 
Jesus alone will save me. Apart from you and Mark's. If Jesus alone cannot save me, I will go to hell. Can you say that? Not because pero, 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 this. No! Jesus alone will save me. And if that is true, I will go to heaven. If not, I will go to hell. Can you say that? With so much confidence. Do you know? Would you be rejoicing when you wake up after your death? You would be jumping and celebrating. You're in front of the pearly gate. Beautiful, isn't it? Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's our prayer that all of us here, when we go out of that door, we are assured that when we die, we will not just be there, but we will walk triumphantly, rejoicing, because we will be in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's close our eyes, bow down our heads. Lord, again, is there anybody here? Lord, I want you guys, if you really have accepted Jesus as your Lord, and say, would you please pray? Perhaps there is someone here who is still unsure, who still doubts that when he dies or she dies, she'll go to heaven. Would you please pray for this person that God will open the eyes of his or her heart? Is there anybody here who is still unsure that when he leaves this place, He's still resting on his works, on the law. That he really can say with so much conviction that Jesus Christ alone will save me. And if that is not true, I am willing to go to hell. Lord, would you just move right now? Would you just, would you just Lord, Open the eyes of the heart of this person or persons, Lord, who are still unsure of you. I know, Lord, that you have orchestrated events in their lives to be here. Friend, if you really want to have a relationship with him, would you follow after me and say this prayer? Well, this prayer won't save you. When you pray this, I'm sure that God will continue to move in your life so that you'll know Him more. Would you repeat after me? God, thank you for this wonderful opportunity you've given me to be here. You can say that. God, thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you've given me to be here. And I've heard of the good news. And I've heard of the good news. Indeed, I'm a sinner. Say that. Indeed, I'm a sinner. I've been running away from you for a long time. I've been running away from you for a long time. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Thank you, O oh God, for opening the eyes of my heart. Thank you, O oh God, for opening the eyes of my heart. To really see what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. To really see what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. I believe that He alone can save me. I believe that He alone can save me. From now on, I accept Jesus as, a, as my Master and Savior. From now on, I accept Jesus as my Master and Savior. Thank you. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Clear description of who we are apart from Christ. And now because of what he has done and what we have believed in, you have reconciled us with you. Would you just bless my brothers and my sisters that they'll grow deep in their knowledge of you. Would you help them, oh God? Would you help them? Thank you. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.